Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's very nice to see you all in uh, such a big number in this beautiful town of Melbourne, and I'm glad that it stopped raining because yesterday was pretty miserable. Um, so I'm happy to be here. So my name is Igor, and uh, together with my brother Marco, we are the creators of Doodle Jump, one of the uh, most successful iPhone apps and iPhone games. And today I will talk about how we got started in the iOS development, why we even jumped into it, and what are some of the things that we've done to help uh, Doodle Jump become such a huge success. So, as you may know, Doodle Jump is one of the best selling iOS titles of all time, and uh, we won Apple Design Award two years ago, uh, which was really fantastic because it not only, you know, we got the the approval from all the fans, from all the people who will play in the game, but Apple actually acknowledged uh, Doodle Jump as uh, one of their favorite apps uh, with the Apple Design World, and that was really fantastic. Uh, the game has become a mobile game classic pretty much. It's now available on pretty much all the mobile devices, and it's uh, been very successful on all of them. And uh, in addition to that, it's become a pop culture phenomena. If you've seen uh, the great new movie starring Rihanna, Battleship, there's a character in it playing the game. Um, it was mentioned in The Big Bang Theory, and, uh, and I don't know how many of you are basketball fans, um, but if you are NBA fans, there's a, there's a great spot in the United States uh, for Sprint that's featuring Kevin Durant, uh, who uh, has a little bit of a doodle jump issues. So uh, if you can check it out online, if you haven't seen it, check it out. So, um, but before Doodle Jump, you know, we've done so many other things. And really where it started was back in the days when my brother and I were kids playing around with the uh, Sinclair ZX Spectrum. I don't know if that was popular in uh, Australia, uh, not so much in the United States, uh, but we grew up in Croatia, Europe, and that was that and Commodore 64 were the big things. And we started playing around with that, creating some simple uh, apps and some or programs at the time, as they were called, and, uh, and some simple games as kids. Over the years, we started uh, working more and more in the, uh, in the computer field, uh, both of us doing some websites and some uh, app designs for the websites and uh, print and all kinds of different things. Uh, but we've never really worked together and we've, over the years we've always wanted to find a way for us to work together on some project. And then in uh, 2007, uh, Steve Jobs introduced the uh, App Store for the iPhone. And we both immediately saw the opportunity to really jump onto it uh, for the following reason. Basically at the time that the App Store was introduced, there were already 10 million people who had the iPhone. And those 10 million people all had their credit card information on file with Apple and all it would take for them to purchase an app for 99 cents would be a touch on a screen. Now the apps were not nothing really spectacularly new. Palm Pilot, if you remember, had apps. But in order to install apps on Palm Pilot, you had to go to the developer's website, download it on the computer, hook up the Palm, um, you know, figure out the payment situation that if you were a developer and so on. And had Apple done the same thing without the kind of distribution mechanism that they, uh, they, they created, we would not get into the game. But our idea from the very beginning was we'll just create a very simple um, apps, something that we would charge 99 cents for, and we figured um, it would be very easy for people to actually spend 99 cents if they didn't have to enter their credit card information. <laughs> mailing address and all that for a simple purchase. So the idea was let's create a very simple app and our very first app was bubble wrap. We figured how difficult can it be to create a bubble wrap simulator, right? You basically just punching some little bubbles on the screen and, um, and it's pretty funny and pretty silly and we figured people would pay 99 cents for it. So my brother didn't know any uh, Objective-C or any code uh, for the Mac platform. We haven't done any Mac programming before. We've both done programming, but not nothing specifically for Mac. So he started kind of figuring that out 
I'm being more of an artistic person than, than him, figured, okay, how hard can it be to photograph a bubble wrap and uh, create graphics for it? Well, you know, three months into the process, we were still working on it, and uh, it, it turned out to be much more difficult than we thought. But we ended up actually creating it and putting it up on the App Store pretty much in the, in, at the, uh, in the first days after the App Store opened. We weren't there the first day, but maybe a week later. And we saw that people were actually buying it. Now, again, this was not, you know, as popular as Tourism or some of the, the apps that were actually popular at the time, but we saw that even such a simple little app could sell um, and could make you some money. Um, the idea initially was really to do this for fun and to, to get some money for, you know, extra money for going out or, you know, for the movies or whatnot. Um, and we, we, we decided that, okay, so we've created one app, let's move on and let's create something else, something just as simple, something that people will be willing to pay 99 cents for. So we did a uh, tic-tac-toe game, which everyone pretty much knows what it is. It's something that's really great for the iPhone because it's simple. But we've, you know, we've added sort of our graphical twist to it, which is this sort of hand-drawn lines, uh, which is something that we've carried through uh, to Doodle Jump and some of the other projects that, that we've done. So we saw that there's something to this, and not only did we see that, but pretty much everyone else saw that once the stories about Trism selling you know, 250,000 copies went out. And suddenly, uh, we've seen the competition come in. Uh, more and more people, more and more studios started creating the apps and games that were really good looking, 3D. You know, I remember um, I was in, I was in I think it was close to the, the first Christmas after the App Store opened and uh, the Digital Chocolate had one of their first apps, Chocolate Frenzy, or, or maybe this one come out. And I'm looking at it and I was like, there's no way we can compete anymore. There will be so many fantastically looking games that, that you know, use these 3D graphics that we just can't do. So we've decided to actually do something else. Instead of trying to compete with um, the 3D um, immersive worlds, we decided to go into a different direction, to kind of find our blue ocean, something that no one else was doing. And we looked at games for kids. So one of the things we've done was this Eat Bunny Eat game, which is kind of silly and, 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 and funny, but you know, one of the, one of the actually best moments in, in my short life as a developer of the iOS apps was reading a review from um, from someone in the UK who purchased the app saying how they played the, the game in the pub trying to uh, better each other's scores and they scream eat bunny eat and you know I can just imagine you know 20 somethings in a British pub drinking you know pints and, and screaming eat bunny eat <laughs> and you know those and, and, and you read that in the morning and and that's you know more than anything that's sort of the that gives you reason to continue and do these things. You're touching so many people around the world um, with the simple apps. Another big um, app for us was Animatch. It's a very simple matching game uh, for kids that you, the goal is to, to find matching pairs of animal heads and the game makes uh, the animal sounds as you turn them around. But one of the things that we introduced in this game by design was the concept of updates. So we launched the game with 10 animals and um, with the idea that we would actually add a new animal every week. So what that did for us was essentially enable us to spend very little time or as little time as possible in the development of the initial release and then uh, add more content over time. Which is actually, the reason why this is great is because you actually see if the, if the game is uh, being liked by your audience or not. But also very early on, Apple had this system where every time you updated the game, every time you updated the app, it would show up on the top of the list of the new releases. But one thing that we found out was actually that not only did this help us on our end with sort of making it easier and faster for us to come out to the market and test the market before we invest more time into it, but people really liked updates. We were starting getting comments from parents 
about, hey, my kids can't wait for the next Friday so, to see which animal would be added next. And we could have released the game with you know, all 30 or 50 animals from release 1.0 and people would play it once and forget about it. This way it gave them a reason to actually come back to the game every single week and see what's new and keep it fresh. Um, so by understanding that, we were actually um, started implementing that concept into our subsequent games. And, you know, another, a few other things that we started realizing is that apps are kind of like digital snacks. They're bite-sized. You kind of, you know, you can have them and, and play them anywhere you want for in a very short period of time. They, they have to be addictive, so you kind of come back to them just like snacks again. Have to have that just one more appeal. You want to play the game once, but once you're done, you kind of want to play it again. And then you have to be able to play it anytime, anywhere. Um, and once, once we kind of, you know, realize that and, and build the the build the concept of development around that idea of a digital snack, uh, that's where we we started seeing a lot of success both on our end and both seeing a lot of success on other apps that have implemented sort of such concept. So Doodle Jump kind of followed that same idea when we initially uh, created it. It was very simple at first with the idea that we would keep on adding more and more content as, we, um, as, the, as the time progressed, as we've seen the reactions from the people, um, from the audience. And uh, it was also developed around the concept of the digital snack. You could play it for a very short time, anywhere. Um, it, it has that just one more game appeal when, when it's game over, you kind of have to play one more game and, um, and so on. So we create the game, we're really excited because we think it's fantastic, we love it. We release it up to the App Store and boom, it sells 21 copies the very first day. <laughs> the worst release we've ever had of all our apps, including some that have sold maybe 300 in total in three years. They sold more on the first day. So what happened? Up until that point, and this was March 2009, there was really no need to do any kind of marketing, promotion, anything for the apps that you were releasing. You, you would basically release an app into the App Store and it would sell just because there weren't that many apps and people were just hungry for new content. I mean, when the App Store launched, there were 500 apps total. I remember sitting um, outside and just going through every single app on the launch day to see uh, what's there. So we've, we kind of figured, okay, it's a great game, we'll launch it and the buzz will do its own thing. But it didn't. And we realized that it's something that um, is actually worth kind of pushing further because we believe it was a fun game, it really had a just one more game appeal, it was intuitive with precise controls, uh, it was perfect for mobile phone, addictive, and most importantly, it passed the wife test. My wife loved the game, and she's not a gamer, and when you have someone who is not a gamer play the game obsessively, not because they're your friend or, you know, uh, family, but because they really, truly really enjoy it, you know there's something to it. So, what did we do? Um, to get Doodle Jump to the top. One thing we did was actually strap the jetpack to his back. The game initially launched without the jetpack uh, power up, and uh, we added the jetpack in one of the um, updates, and it was, a, it was a big success. But more sort of specifically, we started on the huge PR media outreach. I have written so many emails to every single blog out there that was covering um, iOS games. Now, one thing that you know, a lot of people will do and make a mistake um, is kind of email only the big ones first and only. And that's really not the way to do it. The best way to do it is to email really everyone. One of, you know, one of the first blogs that wrote about Doodle Jump is um, louisgray.com. It's a guy that I emailed before uh, about another game that we had, Animatch, and he wrote about it, and I kind of uh, established a relationship and said, hey, I have this really cool game, new one, uh, write about it. So after a while, you know, some of the other blogs started noticing and wrote um, the reviews. And 
the most important thing here to, to remember is kind of the, the idea of being persistent in, the, in, in trying to contact blogs because they get so many emails all the time and sometimes they miss your email just because you know they were, were on a plane when it arrived and never got a chance to see it. Uh, but you also have to be very excited about your product, sort of when, you, when you're writing about it. Imagine, imagine someone reading hundreds of emails a day about you know, different games. Why, why is your app special? What makes it special? Why should I care? So putting that information in, I think it's very important and it's something that we've done from day one, kind of focused on the things that were unique in Doodle Jump. And at the time, there was this, the little score markers that we have on the sides that no one else has had before. And you know that kind of got Apple's attention and um, helped us being featured by Apple and so on. Another thing that we've done is we've started and continued the whole concept of frequent updates. We would keep on adding new content over and over and over um, over the period of time. And we started um, adding new themes for the holidays and certain things that today are kind of a norm and you don't even think about them. But at the time when we introduced them, I, I, I can't claim we were the only ones or the first ones to do the sort of the, the you know the Christmas update, but but it wasn't something that a lot of people thought about at the time. So now you know every season you have all the seasonal updates by, by pretty much all the apps. But it's kind of that thinking of of okay, what else could we do to make this app um, stand apart from the crowd? Another thing that I'm pretty sure we were the first ones to do was the, the sort of the cross promotion crossover. We've um, contacted guys at Pocket God that was, um, as you, you probably all know, Pocket God as well, a fantastic app. And that was actually pretty much, it was on the top of the list for a while around the time when Doodle Jump launched. And uh, we were like, hey guys, what about if we put your character into our game and make, create a little Easter egg that people can uncover and, and uh, play as a pygmy in Doodle Jump. And they loved the idea, they loved Doodle Jump, they said fine. And we did it, and of course it got uh, press interested because it was novel. Of course it got a lot of cr uh, cross promotion and, and a lot of crossover from Pocket God audience into Doodle Jump. And then later on they introduced the Doodle Jump character into Pocket God and we've been kind of cross promoting each other and then suddenly everyone started calling and asking, hey, can we put our character into your game or can we put Doodle Jump into our game? And uh, at, at some point we had to start saying no uh, because some of, the, you know, some of the ideas we were getting were just not matching or had anything in common at all. But again, it was kind of trying to figure out what do we do to help have this game stand apart and be different from everyone else and, and to help media take notice that we're doing something special. Um, also, one of the first things, uh, one of the things that we've done very early on was Facebook Connect integration, where people could sort of post their scores um, to their uh, Facebook pages. And, um, and it, it, it worked really well because you have your friends kind of playing this game that you don't know about, and like, okay, what's Doodle Jump? Let me check it out. Same thing with Twitter, uh, where people were tweeting their scores, and from time to time we had a celebrity tweet the score, and um, with a lot of followers that they have, a lot of people are, what's Doodle Jump? And then they were checking it out, and we started seeing a lot of tweets saying, hey, uh, so and so, thank you so much for getting me hooked on Doodle Jump. So it's just this, you know, basically free promotion that you can do through the tools that are widely available. You just have to integrate them and uh, make sure that um, you know how uh, to do it and to do it well. And we've done a lot of sort of email and uh, communication with, you know, trying to respond to people when they email us and be active on some of the, the gaming forums that are out there. So those are all the ways you can connect with your players and, and uh, spread the news about your game. And we don't do it very often, but we get letters from fans from time to time. And I've actually written some handwritten responses um, back to them. It just, they get really psyched when they see that. So, um, so those are, you know, those are all the things that we've done to actually make sure that we have a very good connection with our players, that uh, they see that we care about the game, that we care about them, and so on.
So with that, I will wrap and say thank you. I'm looking forward to the questions later on in the, uh, in the panel session in the afternoon. And uh, thank you all for coming.